Good afternoon. It looks like our rooms are filling up and we're very excited you, that you're here for the SID Career Fair. This afternoon in this panel, we'll be talking about career paths. Is there only one or are there many? I'm very excited to welcome a very diverse group of speakers who will talk to you from their lens about their career path. My name is Ann Simmons Benton and I'm the Deputy Director of SID uh, Washington and I serve on the board. Um, I am a attorney, but also have 20 years in international development working at state, USAID, commerce, overseas, international development providers, a university and consulting firm. So if something falls through the crack from our wonderful panelists, I may be able to help you there. So what I'm going to ask is each of our panelists to first talk about their career path, ask a few specific questions, and then leave about 20 minutes for the rest of you as participants to ask questions. So think of those questions now. And finally, before we close, we actually have the survey for the whole conference that we would like to ask you to uh, fill out and then the happy hour. But I will remember, remind you of those details before we end. So I'm going to start with Nicholas. And Nicholas, would you share with us your story of uh, your career and you know, how international development, was it something you desired to do or was it something you happened upon? Thanks so much. And uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of this discussion today and the excuse to wear a shirt with buttons on them today. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, I did not, frankly, when I began my career, I didn't know very much about international development as a field. I was a biology major at Morehouse College. So I was focused on the sciences. And midway through college, I realized that being a medical doctor was more my grandmother's dream for me rather than my dream for myself. And so that left me kind of at a crossroads of being uncertain about what I would eventually do. I'd been very involved in community service activities. And so that then became my focus first on the administration of those service type programs, uh, really from a domestic development perspective, I would say. Uh, that morphed into a focus on education. And I worked for the Children's Defense Fund for a number of years, left there uh, and worked for another education nonprofit called the Council for Opportunity in Education, where I had the chance to have my first connection between uh, access to education and access to an internationally relevant, globally focused education and wanting to pursue education as, a, as an equalizer for underrepresented folks. That led to a uh, time working for a spinoff of the United Negro College Fund where I was running a fellowship program called the Institute for International Public Policy, which was focused on increasing diversity in, in, in the international affairs workforce. Went from there to working in, here in Washington for the Peace Corps in a couple of different roles to my current role as uh, at USAID. So no, at the very start, I did not know really about careers in international development. It was through exposure, through uh, networking, through opportunities to do things that were slightly outside of my comfort level at the moment that led me to where I am now. And I've been very grateful for the opportunity to navigate the twists and turns in my career. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with uh, how it's all gone so far. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. I'm sure we're going to have more questions for you moving on. But Amy, can you tell us a little bit about your path and if international development was your first choice or if you want to, you're a biology major like Nicholas? Uh, yeah, actually, um, very similar to uh, Nicholas' path. Um, I also didn't start off in international development. And sorry for my intern back, back there, he's uh, causing a mess. So I'm trying to give him his, give him his privacy. Um, <laughs> I actually uh, considered a lot of different career paths, including uh, marine biology, uh, veterinarian, uh, which is why I have cats. Uh, I have always had animals in my life. Uh, so I volunteered at my local aquarium in high school. Um, that was how dedicated I was to uh, working in uh, working with wildlife. Uh, but uh, my parents' dream for me, just like Nicholas' grandmother had a dream for him, was to uh, go into finance and accounting. Very stereotypical Asian 
parents, uh, first generation Chi uh, Chinese American. Uh, so I went to a, a uh, school in Manhattan, uh, Baruch College, that is very that is very much known for their uh, business programs, MBA programs. Uh, so I explored finance and accounting um, for their benefit and decided right away I hated both. Uh, so I <laughs> went into marketing and I was working in um, in media and sales for almost uh, seven years before I transitioned to grad school. I went to um, the new school for international affairs. Uh, so that was my stepping stone into international development and human rights. Um, I even before then I had always consumed um, a lot of um, of uh, books and movies, documentaries on uh, human rights um, issues around the world. So I was very naturally drawn to it. Um, so while I was in grad school, I went out to Kosovo to do a couple of assignment, independent assignments. Uh, and I used that um, as my field experience when I started applying for jobs. Uh, applied for jobs mostly around the world, um, overseas, and uh, didn't get anything except for um, except for an offer from UNICEF. Uh, so I decided to move from New York to DC. So that's how, uh, that's, that's in my path. Uh, currently I am a project delivery manager at Palladium uh, in my portfolio is, um, well, I, sorry, I'm a project del delivery manager at Palladium um, on the Calize project. It's a, it's a USAID funded uh, project in economic growth. Um, so in my portfolio, I uh, work on the core team for the project as well as the uh, Asia activities and uh, our Ethiopia activities. Great, thank you so much. Zahabia, I was lucky enough to work with Zahabia at SID where she did a wonderful job, but she has a new job now. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I guess I'll go back to, I was a political science and Russian major in college. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to do something internationally. I wasn't sure what, um, and I saw that there was a born scholarship available through my school. Um, and those who don't know, it's uh, funded by the DOD and they allow undergraduates to continue uh, a fifth year of college um, or a fourth year of college, depends on where you are, um, to a critical language uh, to the US. So I continued Russian um, and I was in Kazakhstan for a year. And so upon returning, I knew that I wanted to do something in international development, but that's a very broad uh, topic. And so said Washington was kind of the first place that I was targeting because it was seemed like a great way to have my foot in the door to really understand DC to understand international development what technical sectors I might want to work in um, working directly for USAID or as a USAID implementer and so within my two years I kind of narrowed down that Comonix would have been the next best step um, and so I joined Comonix uh, just this past May um, and I'm currently a senior associate in the project management unit um, in the Europe and Eurasia region. And I work on two projects, one in Ukraine and one in Kosovo. Thank you so much. Now we're gonna to turn to Marshall who has a very different path and is outside the DC area. Marshall, can you fill us in on your life? I can, thanks Anne. And, and mine was not a linear path into, into global development. So I'll start with a couple of formative experiences that kind of pushed me in that direction. First, um, my dad was in the Navy and we moved a lot and I had wanderlust and, and um, was always curious about the, the world outside of wherever it was that we lived. And the second is that I'm a gay man. And as I was struggling with my identity after graduating high school in 1984, the AIDS crisis was just starting to be covered by the press. And the story that was being told was that God hates fags, gays deserve to die, gay cancer, all of that. And while I wasn't HIV positive as a gay person, I saw my story being told for me and I understood what it felt like to be portrayed as a disease or a condition. Um, I went to Wake Forest and I, you know, I cobbled together an international degree of, of sorts, which was communications in Latin American literature. And then I moved to Atlanta where I worked in arts administration. And the thing that kind of changed my trajectory was a good friend of mine in his early twenties, Tim was dying of AIDS complications and he asked me to plan his funeral. And it was the second friend who would ask me to do that. And I agreed and, you know, as he got closer to death, it became really difficult for me to be close to him and see his decline. Um, and a job became available at Aid Atlanta, which is the aid service organization where Tim had received some services. And I applied for that job. I thought this is something I'm gonna do for Tim. 
And my parents tried to talk me out of it. They said, if you take that job, no one's ever gonna hire you again if you're working on AIDS. Um, and I did it anyway. It was an amazing job. Uh, at 28, I was voted one of the 50 people shaping Atlanta along with Jimmy Carter, which was quite an honor and probably a mistake. Um, and then I decided to really pursue the international part. So I moved to DC intentionally um, and it took a few years, but I landed at Population Services International, PSI. It's a big global NGO working in 50 countries on health. And I led external relations and advocacy and global partnerships. And one of the last things I worked on at PSI was the creation of an in, uh, initiative chaired by Melinda Gates and the Crown Princess of Norway to engage women philanthropists in the health and rights of girls and women. And what struck me from that experience just was the, the power differential between a funder, a philanthropist and a donor in the community. And the power that NGOs and philanthropy has in speaking for other people and making decisions for other people. And so I wanted to be a, a part of an effort to, to shift that. And a job became available at the Conrad Hilton Foundation. And uh, the foundation was doubling its endowment from three to currently seven and a half billion. Um, and you know, they say in philanthropy, you can be the grid and the oyster. So that was appealing to me. Um, today, I oversee global partnerships, advocacy and communications for the foundation. And I'm in a position to help strengthen that movement to you know, drive greater funding to local organizations, encourage greater participation uh, by people with lived expertise in funding and program decisions that are about them um, and push our community writ large for better and ethical representation of people served. So that's, you know, that's my path. And it, it, I think the things that really drove me were, um, you know, I, I was always moved by the people that society cared least about. So I think that was, that was my entry point. Well, thank you for sharing that, Marshall. Uh, I really appreciate your, your honesty and, and sharing that story. Um, um, you know, I think everyone's mentioned something a little bit about impediments in their way. Um, as far as education, um, you talked about it, but were there any things that have helped you in your job today? Probably not biology for Nicholas. And, um, but uh, did anything in your education help you get your first job? Do you think a master's or PhD helps you get that job or continue in your career? Um, and is there anything you would make a recommendation for, for people? <clears throat> I'm just gonna say for education, um, my father told me I couldn't go to Georgetown School of Foreign Service because girls did not need degrees. They just needed to get married. So <clears throat> lots of times impediments put in our way just make us more determined. And, uh, you know, so I would like to hear from you how um, education each helped you or any particular recommendations. It could be a writing course or whatever, but we've got a lot of students and recent graduates on the call. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas. Sure. So that, that is a big question. Uh, the first thing that came to mind when you asked the question was to say, to explain for people who might be unfamiliar with Morehouse College, it's an all male liberal arts college, historically black college located in Atlanta, Georgia. I also used to volunteer for Aid Atlanta Marshall, so we have that in common. Um, the benefit I think of attending a, a liberal arts college is that it exposes you to lots of things. It exposes you to what's in the career path that you're following or the course of study that you are prescribed to, but it also through events on campus and through uh, friends who have different disciplines, it exposes you to the things to which they are being exposed as well. So I, I think that learning about international development happened in part because I was friends with people from the Caribbean and from African countries and from uh, other places. Uh, it, it also, uh, to your kind of tongue in cheek comment about biology, I do think that biology did train me in, with, in specific ways of thinking, right? So the scientific method and the scientific inquiry leads you to hypothesize about certain things and then conduct your experiment, whatever that might be, to see if your hypothesis holds true and recognizing that there are a number of different factors that lead to whatever the end result was. So having that biology background, I'm sure, even though the, the, the 
techniques, I suppose, or some of the subject matter was not is not particularly relevant to the work that I'm doing now. Uh, it certainly was formative in my early career and now. Uh, to your point about education, I took about 10 years between undergrad and grad school, and I pursued a master's in higher education administration at George Washington. And that was because I was working in education focused nonprofits. And my, I would love to say that I did it completely for the love of and thirst for knowledge. That would be slightly inaccurate. I'm a, a far too pragmatic person, I think, for that to be the case. I recognized that I was living in DC as one of the most highly educated parts of the country. And in order to be uh, given a shot at getting my foot in the door, it helped me to have an additional credential. And so that is one among other reasons, but that's one of the reasons why I pursued a master's degree uh, in that field that I was in at the time. So I do think that as someone who has been a hiring manager, um, while I wouldn't put everything on someone's achievement of a, a hired, uh, of a graduate degree, it is a tool that is often used to differentiate among candidates, many of whom have lots of great and relevant background. So I, I, as a, a practical consideration, I would say having a graduate degree is helpful in international affairs and in other career fields as well. Thank you, Amy. Do you concur? Or do you have other other words of wisdom here? Um, likewise, uh, just as uh, Nicholas feels very strongly about a liberal arts education, uh, which I completely agree with. Um, I, I kind of did it in reverse, where I did a specialized undergraduate education, and then I went to a liberal arts school for my master's degree. Um, I I don't regret my business background at all, uh, because now almost uh, two decades later. Um, at the risk of dating myself, um, I have used my business knowledge in so many other ways. Uh, three years ago, when I came back from my uh, last assignment in, um, in Afghanistan, I started my own social enterprise because I wanted to do something that's a little bit more impactful, immediately impactful, uh, while I was still working in development um, and, you know, and implementing five-year-long, six-year-long projects. Uh, so with my, uh, with my social enterprise, um, I... Uh, I'm not going to go too much into it now, but um, I, I work with local partners and uh, work directly with immigrants, refugees, survivors of gender-based violence. Uh, but a lot of it, just like starting up any um, business, I had to bootstrap a budget. You know, marketing was done by me. Um, uh, business development was done by me. So without my business background, I, I wouldn't have been able to do all that. It would have been a lot harder. Uh, so what that has, what that experience has led me is to my current role at Palladium. I mean, I'm on a planet finance um, project which works with um, private sector enterprises. So uh, it's interesting how everything uh, has married together um, between my uh, business background and uh, my 10 years in international development. As for all the questions I see in the chat about, um, about whether a master's degree is necessary, I would say not really. Um, experience matters a lot. Um, I, just like Nicholas, I had took a break between um, my undergrad degree and my graduate degree. I took about four or five years to, to work, um, and I saw the difference between myself and uh, my fellow uh, classmates who had work experience um, as well, um, and how that differed from the uh, students who came in right from undergrad. It was just it, it just broadens your um, your role view so you can contribute more to conversations and you also know yourself a little bit more as well. Um, so I, I do recommend a break between the, between the degrees to learn more about yourself. And um, I don't think a master's degree is always necessary. Um, take that time to get your work experience and explore what you really wanna do with um, in terms of your day-to-day -day work and uh, your, or your own interests and passion. Thank you, Amy. Zahabia, you are the closest to school. Um, do you have something to add here to this conversation? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I can't speak about master's, but in terms of my bachelor's degree, uh, very similar to Nicholas, I went to Bryn Mawr, so liberal arts college, all women. Um, and in a very similar vein, it was a really great opportunity to meet so many people from around the US and the world. So in my political science classes, there was so much more discussion. And I think that definitely helped me 
figure out that I wanted to do something in international development at a college level. Um, I also think that my experience at Bryn Mawr uh, really allowed me to gain skills like critical thinking, um, being able to adapt, multitask, um, and stay organized because I was surrounded by other incredible women who were doing a thousand things at once. Uh, and so they kind of, you know, made me motivated to do more as well. Um, so I think that my education at Bryn Mawr really helped me, um, as, as well as opportunities that Bryn Mawr allowed me to, you know, study abroad and to become a born scholar, that has definitely shaped where I am today. Thank you, Zahabia. Marshall, what about you? So I too, I too was a liberal arts graduate from Wake Forest. And, you know, the, my thoughts on advanced degrees, I'm not anti-education at all. Um, and I think they probably help people that where I think we are struggling, at least as a foundation and probably as a community is from an equity perspective. And so when you look for uh, candidates and you're valuing someone's advanced degree over someone's lived experience, what does that mean? And so I think that's a struggle that, that we are facing as a, as a funder. And I think about one of the areas that we focus on is foster youth at a tra transition aid foster youth. And maybe there's not an advanced degree, but it's discounting the moving, the adaptability, the stress, the struggles that people have gone on and those coping skills and what that means from a professional environment. So I don't have an answer for that. Um, my hope in the future is that uh, we will value ex different types of experience in a more equitable way. Yeah, you know, Marshall, that's a very good point. And Sid Washington actually has a diverse diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, working group. Uh, and so looking at ways to build a pipeline for international development is what it focuses on. So if anyone is interested in that particular area, please go to the, the CID site and look at it. Um, and we actually also have a task force that we've taken up this year because we think it's so important overall. Um, uh, Amy, you sort of mentioned um, uh, your firm, Crescendo. So it makes me think about volunteering. Our, and uh, Zahabia, you know, when you talked about all those other women with being organized. So I'd like to ask each of you if, that, if there's anything about volunteering or outside activities that you did, even sports or whatever, music, that you think um, contributed to either your career or your growth as a person. Yeah, so I always love to share a story of my uh, great uncle who, ha who, was, um, uh, who had a huge influence in my life. I didn't have a very strong father figure. I came from a, a pretty violent home where, um, where um, there was a lot of domestic violence and um, a lot of trauma. So uh, thankfully, I was um, uh, kind of raised by my great uncle, and he had always imparted onto me this lesson in value of giving back when you're able to. Um, so I've taken, I really try to embody that and I've always volunteered, I've always done volunteer work, um, starting with, starting at the age of 11 or 12 when I uh, was reading to kids at my local library. And I mentioned earlier that I volunteered at my um, local aquarium in Coney Island uh, for four years in high school. Uh, since then, I've worked with um, other first generation college students um, because I'm the first one in my immediate family to, uh, to graduate uh, from college and then get a master's degree. Um, so... Since then, since I've been to DC, I've also been on the volunteer staff of uh, Young Professionals in Foreign Policy. I really recommend YPFP for all you out there who are young professionals and would like to network more. Uh, it's, it's a great um, platform to uh, meet other like-minded um, folks in, uh, profession in foreign policy as well as, well as international development. Uh, but after that, I um, currently I am a, also on the volunteer staff at CITW as uh, one of the co-chairs for, uh, for the Independent Consultant Networking Group. Uh, so check that out if you're, uh, if you're in consulting. Um, but uh, in my free time outside of Palladium and Crescendo, um, I also volunteer with an Asian American um, uh, entrepreneurship group. So I'm always looking out for these uh, volunteer opportunities. I do a lot of mentorship as well. So I, that, like for those of you who have already reached out to me um, with private messages, you see me telling you, yeah, feel free to reach out because I'm always happy to chat uh, and I, I'm always happy to take on new mentees. Uh, yeah, so, and in short, volunteering is very important. Uh, it's helped me uh, learn more about myself and it's helped me give back at the same time. 
Thank you so much. Nicholas. Uh, I agree completely with what Amy just said. I also agree with the point that Marshall made earlier about uh, education and volunteerism and the engagement, the life experience. So I think from some of the comments that I've seen in the chat, I absolutely think that uh, serving as a Peace Corps volunteer, for example, is uh, it takes a longer period of time than most master, master's degrees. So that certainly uh, should not be discounted. I think that volunteering is an opportunity to give and as well as grow personally. I have, uh, just as Amy said, I've been volunteering in some capacity uh, since my very early teenage years, maybe even before then. I currently am a volunteer board member for the Osgood Center for International Studies, which provides Model United Nations and, and other uh, international experiences for college students and recent graduates. I am a, a mentor. I volunteer as the USAID mentoring program, a mentor in that program, and a number of other programs. So I definitely think that volunteerism is important. You gain very tangible, practical skills through volunteering. Uh, I'm also the recipient, I'm the beneficiary of people who volunteer to help me at different phases of my life. And it's philosophically something that is very important to me. I do note that my types of volunteerism has morphed over time. Uh, so at one point I was very involved in church volunteerism. Uh, at one point I was very involved in hands-on mentoring on a very regular basis. Now working full-time, being in a pandemic, uh, being the father of a, a young child, my volunteerism has become much more targeted, but it's still part of who I am. I recognize the, the, the benefits that I have gained as the recipient of someone's volunteerism, as well as the benefits that I have gained from being a volunteer in a range of different circumstances. So I, I, I think that the vol volunteerism aspect of careers in international affairs is also a very important perspective. And I'm, I'm glad that you included it in this conversation. Thank you, Nicholas. I do think, honestly, the people that are drawn to international development are one of the greatest groups for service and uh, have a sort of ethos. So I think it's very interesting, the types of different volunteerism just four people have here. Zahabia, can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I second and third everything that Amy and Nicholas just said. Um, I too grew up in a household where volunteering was important. Um, my mom is a social worker and a humanitarian in every shape, way, and form. Um, and so I had did volunteering when I was younger, um, but currently I've been working uh, and volunteering at American Councils for International Education. Um, and for those who don't know this organization, they have a connection with the State Department's YES and FLEX programs, which bring high school students from different parts of the world to the US for one year of high school. Um, and so I'm an evaluator for these students. So seeing their essays, host family letters, uh, interviews, things like that. And you know, it, it's something that I really enjoyed because I, used American councils for my own study abroad in Russia and in Kazakhstan. And so it was something that I feel very close to because I was able to do that myself. Um, and I think I agree that, that volunteering and giving back is such an important part, especially if someone as that's in international development, I think it does go hand in hand. Um, but one thing I did wanna just flag that I know my peers have said to me before with getting into more volunteering is there's sometimes a hesitancy to begin volunteering because it might seem daunting or scary to forever continue once a week or every day. And volunteering shouldn't be something scary and it shouldn't be something that makes you feel like a bad person if you can't continue it every single week, every single month. There's gonna be things that happen in your life where you can't always volunteer and that's okay. I still think that volunteering in any way, shape or form is great. Um, so I did want to just stress that because I've heard that concern from some of my own friends. Thank you, Zahabi. I think that boundaries piece, um, creating those boundaries so you do what you can do is really important. And I don't think, I think that's a big hurdle that you've explained in a really great way. Uh, Marshall, can I turn to you now? 
Sure, I, I can't really add anything to the comments on volunteering. I think the, the, what I would add is, um, you know, also look for internships and, and try to make yourself uh, invaluable. I think that's that's a good thing. And the other part of the question was, was there anything from your, you know, experience as a young person that was meaningful or helped you? And I played soccer in high school and college, and I played midfield, and I was the person that set the led the the team in assists. So I was never the one scoring, but I like to be a playmaker from behind the scenes. And I realized that's something innate about me. And so the the jobs that I have taken have really um, exploited that component of me, where you know, I can put things together. That's what I really like to do, put things together behind the scenes and then push it out for other people. Um, one of the questions in the chat was, what do you wish you had known earlier in your career? Um, a couple of things. One, uh, everyone feels like an imposter often and sometimes. Um, and then two, uh, more than anything, what's got me to where I am is diligence, knowing how to get to yes and being a creative thinker and problem solver. So when I'm hiring, I look for those um, those qualities in people. Great, thank you. I'm going to ask one more quick question to the group and then we are directly gonna to turn to all those questions that are gathering up there. But thank you, Marshall, for keeping us on track and, and answering some of them now. Um, and this is skills. Um, Often I hear from students, oh, well, I want to go into the foreign service. I want to do international, but I don't have a language. Is that a non-starter? So are there particular skills that you must have? Or are there something that you think would advance someone? Uh, and sometimes nowadays it can be a certificate course. Is it project management? Is it, is it STATA? You know, learning how to do statistics. Is it taking monitoring uh, evaluation and learning courses? So, if you could quickly just give something that either helped you or that you would make a recommendation for others, that would be great. Should I start? Yes, now? Nicholas, sorry, okay. I started to read the questions now. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I, um, I think that there are a couple of ways that you can look at that. So there are hard skills and then there are what have been termed as soft skills. So I would say that the skills that have been most helpful to me are budgeting, for example, and project planning, project management. Those are very important skills that are transferable skills that I think are important, really irrespective of the industry that you're part of. Those are very helpful skills. I think within international affairs and international relations, the so-called soft skills become even more important. So I would say tolerance and comfort within ambiguity, for example, uh, the ability to successfully create and manage and maintain relationships. Uh, and so communication is a big part of that. So being able to uh, effectively and cogently communicate an idea and to build some will around that or, or build uh, support for an idea. I think that those things are very important. But I, I come back to one of the things that one of my mentors said to me that was not like one of the most profound thoughts, but it, it had some significant profundity in my life. It's in the world of work, it's not as though uh, businesses do work with businesses. It's not like departments interface with departments, it's people. So if you focus on the humanity, if you focus on what people need, if you focus on the people, and build relationships based on that, you will very likely be successful in everything that you try to, uh, to undertake because you have focused on the people who are needed in order to get the yes, to get the job done, to make the connection that you need. So I would say that the, the overarching skill or attribute that I would say is most important is a focus on relationships. I did want to, uh, I guess coming back also to the point about ambiguity, this follows on to Marshall's response to the question about what I wished I knew. I would say one of the things that I think is probably most salient for this audience is the capacity for reinvention. So you can tell from the majority of people on this panel, we didn't start with in international affairs. We transitioned into it after we learned more, after we saw about how 
the experiences that we gained in other fields and other disciplines could be applicable. And so I think one of the other important themes to take away is that pivots are possible within your career. And even though you may have the most wonderful plan that you've conceived of from your infancy or toddlerhood or wherever you came up with this wonderful plan, it is possible to pivot. It is possible to, uh, to shift and to create new plans based on new experiences that you have had. Nicholas, I'm writing that down for me. Pivots are possible because I think I'm entering the third chapter of life here. So I'm just going to own that for the moment. Uh, turn, turning to Amy now. Uh, so I get this question a lot from um, young professionals um, who reach out to me or even uh, newcomers to DC when they say, oh, you know, I, I see on your LinkedIn profile that you have a lot of experience working with USAID and, and, all, and even a brief, um, a brief stint at USAID. Um, so I, when they ask me that, my first question is always, how familiar are you with USAID rules and regs? Um, because what a lot of people don't realize is that USA has its complete own set of um, way of doing business um, that you won't find at state or at uh, USDA or at the treasury because um, those are, I need those three agencies because they also have their own foreign service um, uh, work too. Uh, USA has its own set of rules and regulations that uh, require a lot of uh, training on. And for those of us who were, who were lucky enough, you know, we might get into an implementing partner that will uh, cover the cost of that training, uh, but for many, it's um, it's it's uh, getting zoned into a, uh, the deep end of the pool when you go into um, a job and they're saying, "Oh, read this contract over," and uh, and we have to follow these requirements. So I so I always recommend rules and regulations for USAID if that is what you're interested in working in. Um, if you're interested in the uh, foreign service, it's a whole different set of skills, and that's uh, kind of what Nicholas touched on. Um, you know, all the soft skills, uh, relationship building. Um, I also recommend um, writing skills are critical, especially for those who are interested in doing some volunteer work or Peace Corps uh, volunteering um, of, before they jump into a full-fledged career, because uh, th those skills are much needed overseas uh, for smaller partners that might not have um, uh, th those skill sets on hand. Um, they're always looking for, you know, uh, fluent um, or native English speakers and writers. Um, so yeah, I don't think there, I have anything else that Nicholas hasn't covered. He gave a very thorough answer. So Amy, can I ask you, because there's a question in the chat to expand mm -hmm. upon, how do you get grant experience um, other than taking a course? Do you have any other recommendations? Yeah, offering uh, volunteering is, an, is, is, I come back to volunteering again because you can uh, volunteer for a small, very, very small uh, NGO or nonprofit that uh, is looking for um, um, someone who can, do, who can do grant writing for them pro bono. That will give you the experience um, as well as uh, your, uh, what you call your win rate um, to say, hey, I, I have written six grants, uh, grant proposals for uh, X number of, of NGOs or nonprofits, and, and I've won 50% of them. I mean, that's a great number in the, the business development uh, field. So, um, so yeah, once again, I go back to volunteering. But of course, uh, volunteering also um, leads us to another discussion about access, because there are some folks who just don't have the, um, the uh, financial freedom or the uh, even the time and resources to volunteer much of their time. They have to get to work right away. Uh, so for folks like that, I, I recommend uh, getting in at an organization um, with a paid position um, at any level, even if it's just a temp job. That's how I started here in DC. I was doing temp work for a year before I landed my first full-time position as a project associate. And that was with my seven years of uh, prior experience as a project manager in another career field. Thank you. Zahabia. Yeah, sure. So there were two things I wanted to say. One about skills that you can gain that you that don't require international experience or field experience, because this is something that some people have asked me, especially because of the pandemic, you know, not being able to go abroad. They don't have experience in Peace Corps. Um, they they believe that they must have some type of international experience in order to you know gain a job in international development as an entry level position. And while I'm not one to talk because I've had a lot of international experience, I think that 
there are a few skills that are transferable that recruiters are still looking for. So one is your communication skills. How can you communicate with a wide range of people? Um, are you able to adapt to situations? And are you able to handle, you know, hard tasks, hard things? Can you adapt from that? I mean, that happens when you're abroad, you're put in a, a new place, new language, new people. How are you able to adapt and thrive in that way? So I would say adapting and communication skills are, are really important. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted just to mention about some skills that, you know, might help entry level or, you know, get a job here is what everyone is doing right now at Sid Washington, joining conferences and career fairs and, and trying to network because to be honest, before I came to DC, I didn't know what an informational interview was. So that was news to me. I had to figure that out. And I, I definitely realized how small DC and international development is. And there are a lot of people that are willing to help you. Um, you would be surprised how many people are rooting for you who are just strangers. So I would say continue to do things like this, continue to connect. Um, and I know that it's kind of strange virtually because you can't have the in-person coffee chat, but continue to use LinkedIn and email because that's probably the best way to can continue networking. Great. Um, and Marshall, can you add on to that? And I want to sort of point out um, to bring where we were from Zahabia's remarks. Um, that a couple of people, Amanda Eggers, and people have, uh, uh, you know, weighed in on hers. But let's just say you are mid-level uh, professional with very global experiences, but do not have any direct traditional development experience. Can you add uh, some uh, remarks to that along with your skill that, that I had asked you originally? Sure. I, I mean, I, I think I go back to what Nicholas underscored and others did as well as um, emotional intelligence and self-awareness uh, go a long way. I've seen great ideas fall apart because someone doesn't know how to read a room. Um, and so really developing that within yourself. Um, also understanding if you can travel, but cultural competence is understanding how different cultures operate is so important in international development. Um, how the time people take to do different things is very different around the world. So understanding that. Um, and you know the the technical training piece depends on where you want to go, but yes, to to get technical training, but it depends on where. So if you pair your soft skills with the technical, um, I think that's helpful. And and you know I think a, an asset based approach when you're looking for a job um, that might be not within your industry, but you know what it is that that you've done that you can bring to that new position. And honestly, you know in the places where I've worked at PSI, we always wanted people who worked in the private sector and the corporate sector. We, we valued them weirdly better and differently than people in the NGO sector. And at the foundation, you know, probably the same, someone from the corporate sector or someone from outside of, of philanthropy would be an interesting hire. So I would say exploit that. Thank you. As a matter of fact, I was USA first private sector engagement. We called it a business advisor in Russia in 1996 because I was a commercial lawyer. So uh, <clears throat> the rest is history. Um, there's a question about temp agencies to look at for a foot in the door. Now, I don't know that really there are temp agencies in our business, but maybe um, uh, if someone knows on the panel, they could address that. But maybe there's also ways, because I've seen short-term ways <clears throat> when someone's on maternity leave. So maybe uh, uh, either Zahabia or, uh, or, or Amy could answer. Oh, everyone looks like they can answer. So go ahead, Nicholas. I'll... Sorry. Thanks. So this, this is not a direct answer to the question about temp agencies. I'm, I'm, I don't have much awareness of temp agencies that specialize in international affairs. Uh, but what I can say is that many, what most federal agencies do is they contract, they have implementing partners. So a lot of the work that USAID, for example, does happens because of the great work that Chemonix does or that Palladium does or that any number of the other partners do. And there are, generally speaking, a wealth of entry level to mid-level and even senior level opportunities, both at the organizations themselves, as well as within the discrete projects that exist that would be funded by USAID or, or any other agency. 
So one of the things that I have recommended that some of my, uh, some of the career focused conversations that I've had with people do is if you're looking for, if you're looking to find out the, the contract organizations that do work with USAID, for example, you can Google USAID's top contractors. I, I'm pretty sure I found a top 10 list or a top 15 list, and you can look at the, the companies that are represented there, and you can go to those companies and explore the opportunities that they have on their website. That is good practical. Uh, it's a good practical exercise that might lead to finding an opportunity that's a match, but it also gives you awareness about the different levels, the different qualifications for different levels, the areas in which these companies are focused and the types of positions that for which they are hiring. And so I, I have found, I have heard that others have found that to be a tremendously helpful piece of advice uh, as a way to start a process that might otherwise just seem so big as to be unmanageable. That sounds great, Nicholas. In addition to that, Sid on their website uh, has a link for all the companies well that do business with USAID, the UN, et cetera. And uh, for people who are at the career fair, there's information already on those links right there. So uh, Amy, can I turn to you? Yeah, since I was the one who brought the, um, the temp agencies, um, I did drop um, one recommendation in the chat uh, for Ronstadt.USA. That was the firm that placed me with uh, first with um, the Pediatric AIDS Foundation, um, they, they're mostly funded by CDC, uh, I'm sorry, not CDC, um, at the time it was the, um, it was the AIDS, it was the presidential AIDS um, funding, I forgot what, what that funding is called now, legislation, yeah, PEPFARS, right, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and also CDC, but, um, and then after that, um, that long-term position, long-term temp position ended, I was there for nine months, they sent me to App Associates. Uh, and I could have stayed there indefinitely, um, but that was when I landed my my first full time position uh, here in DC, uh, and I had moved on to IFAS. Um, but I brought the temp agency be, uh, agencies uh, as an option for those who um, just don't have the privilege to spend their time volunteering for free or interning for free. Um, so, so that's just one way to make sure you're continuing to bring in an income while you're learning on the job and. Uh, once you get into those uh, institutions, you know, network, 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 let everyone know that you're temp, let everyone know that you're job searching. I got my job at ISIS because um, one of my coworkers at App Associates um, uh, uh, knew I was, um, I was a temp because I told her and that I was uh, looking for a full-time position. So she connected me with her husband who was at ISIS at the time. And that's how I, that's how I landed the job. Um, so that's, that's why I brought up the temp agencies. Um, and did I answer your question fully? Was there something else? No, that's great. And I actually think it's, it's quite interesting because I had no idea about temp agencies and there's quite a few other answers in here. But what about um, uh, Zahabia? Is there anything that Comonix does that you know of uh, to get people in uh, short term? Yeah, so Comonix does have internship positions as well. Um, that you can check back on the website for when they're available. But there was something that Amy mentioned that I wanted to, to tap into as well if you are still in school, is to check your career services or your deans, ask them about any opportunities at all for funding, whether that's a, an internship or study abroad program or what have you, because that is one of the ways that I had my first internship in DC in 2015. Um, it was it was not a paid internship, but Bryn Mawr was able to cover those costs. So, and I didn't know about it to begin with. It was only through a couple of meetings that I found out different avenues. So that I would say also to definitely check in with your, your schools and also your professors because they might know of other programs outside of what the school is offering. You know, and I was uh, prior to my current in, uh, incarnation, I was uh, leading Arizona State University's international development program uh, for the last four years. And it was amazing the number of firms in uh, the area that were very interested in internships, as long as you help them create the pipeline and uh, you know, get the students there, et cetera. So um, I think that you're, you're right, Zahabia, there's a different entry point for students. And Marshall? 
Sure, at the Hilton Foundation, we use both temps and interns. Um, I think the point I want to make is, was brought up was on networking. And, you know, knowing someone through someone else is such an effective way to meet people. And I think my uh, astrological sign says I can be a bit manipulative. And so the trick that I would use is, is asking for advice. Everyone likes to be asked for advice, appeal to someone's ego. Can I get some advice and guidance from you? Nobody's going to say no to that. So it's, it's for me, it's worked a lot. And then you get into a conversation, but, you know, tap your friends, tap people, you know, make those connections and then ask for advice. I think that there's a, a fundraising adage that says, ask for money and you get advice, ask for advice and you get money. Oh, interesting. Well, we're gonna have you help us with more of that. There is an interesting question in there uh, about whether they should pursue a JD or a master's in international relations. Um, does anyone else on this group, uh, if not, since I have a JD, <laughs> I, can, I can answer that. Um, but if anyone else has, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll call on you first, so. Okay, okay, Amy. I don't have much to share except that, um, except for my own experience, I actually did explore JD after I finished my uh, master's degree. Uh, because I thought I wanted um, to practice international um, human rights law um, and work in Geneva or um, The Hague. Um, but after speaking to a lot of lawyers uh, and professors, I decided to, um, to table it for now. So I would say do your research uh, to speak to people who are lawyers and um, uh, are, in, are in the track that you're interested in to uh, find out exactly why you want to pursue a JD. Um, so, so yeah, just do your research before you commit. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna add to that. Um, and I'm gonna say, I love being a lawyer. Uh, 30 years later, I still read and do my continuing legal educations. And, and, and I think it helps me, but I also am in trade. So I can pick up any international agreement. Um, I love the FAR, I love the ADAR. I'm like a legal nerd and, and I'll own that. Um, but does it really help you get the job, not necessarily. And I will answer as a parent and say that taking student loans for something you're really not going to use is a really scary um, prospect, you know, for that, you know, that master's or JD degree. So it's really, I think, the model where you go and you work for a couple of years and then you kind of feel like, oh, I wish I knew that. Um, uh, whether it's, you know, because business is important, uh, but there are a lot of things you can learn on the job. And so before you take out debt, unless you have someone who's like just going to give you the education or you get a scholarship, then I would really think hard. It's a very uh, specialized type of knowledge. And a lot of people who get law degrees don't use it. I would say people who get business degrees are more likely to use that knowledge than, than lawyers. Um, and I don't think there's, there's any real requirement. It really depends on what you want to do. Uh, can can I also yeah. just add that I, I think, just looking at some of my colleagues, some of them have JDs. I, I, one person who was recently with our team had a PhD in, in chemical engineering. I have a background in higher education administration. So there's not just one degree. Certainly there are a master's in international affairs could be helpful if you're interested in development. A JD with the right kind of coursework could be interesting as well. But I don't think that there is one type of degree that is necessarily a, a, a direct path into international development. Uh, and in some cases, there are colleagues who are leaders in the field who don't, who don't have graduate degrees. So that's not to say that a graduate degree is required. So I, I, I think that, um, I think that's just a, an important bit of context to note as well. Yeah, and the other thing I might note is that um, uh, I know State Department did, I don't know if USA does, um, but also some businesses and consulting firms often give, well, it used to be a $5,000 stipend, I don't know what it is, per year for a master's. So if you get a job and you wanna pursue it, then you may actually get assistance from an employer. And that's certainly, something to look at. 
um, as you're as you're going there. Um, we've got a couple of interesting pieces of advice um, about that other people are giving in the chat room as well about whether these are are, are worth it or not. Um, let me just find one more last question here. Um, actually, maybe what I'll do because we have only four minutes. Um, uh, is to remind everyone to please take the survey and then uh, they can go, yes, there is a tuition assistance, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, take the survey and then join the group in the happy hour. But if there's one more, one last piece of advice that each of you could give, um, uh, and maybe it's about where we are now, um, after coming through, not having finished, but a year of COVID, you know, are you feeling more optimistic or less optimistic? Or, you know, is there something about COVID that has made this a harder time to get a job? Nicholas, does USA, did USA slow down its hiring or anything? Or is it speeding up again? Well, I think the federal government slowed down its hiring up until fairly recently. Um, the, the pandemic has been difficult for people, I think, irrespective of their career path, a career field. This has been a, a time where we have explored all kinds of new things. Like I have not physically been in my office in the Reagan building at USAID since March. And so that's almost a year. And that is really strange. So there are so many new uh, just ways of working that we've had to do that we are hopeful to see how everything might play out and eager to see how it, what that might mean for the future workforce. Um, I, I see that someone did, put, Florence put a, a comment in that USAID is currently hiring a whole swath of foreign service officers, which is true. Uh, I, to, to answer your question about how, I, I think you said something like, how am I feeling these days? Uh, I watched President Biden's speech yesterday. He gave a pretty short speech at the State Department, and uh, I was tremendously encouraged by the seriousness with which he ascribed, or to which he ascribed, development. So international policy, I think anyone who has worked within international affairs knows that it's diplomacy, development, and defense are the three stools, the three legs of the stool, and to see diplomacy and development elevated was absolutely encouraging to me and I think most of the people who work within uh, USAID and the career field as well. Thank you. I, I also thought that was very moving and for anybody who missed it, it is available on the State Department YouTube site, um, maybe other places, but I know that. Marshall, um, how are you feeling? Uh, I am feeling relatively hopeful. I mean, I, th I think there's one thing that COVID has done in the US, certainly it's, it's underscored racial inequity. Um, and I think the international equivalency of that is the decolonization discussion that's happening. Um, and, you know, how to uh, put people in communities more in control of their own outcomes. So if I were looking into a career in development, that's something in the future that I think will probably become more acute. Um, and would be something that, that I would pay attention to. Um, but I have really enjoyed this conversation. Amy or Zahabia, Zahab, Zahabia, 444, anything quick to add to this? I'll try to make this really quick. Um, when I, I always uh, tell people who are still trying to figure out what they want to do is to write down a list of their interests and their passions and then write down a second list of what they wouldn't mind doing on a day-to-day. -day. Because I think what a lot of young professionals do or junior level um, staff do is they go into, um, into a job thinking, right, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on the field right away. Uh, but um, that's really not always the case. Uh, I would say majority of the time, that's not the case. Um, you have to you know, learn the job first. Um, you have to be um, realistic and expect some admin work first, especially as you're learning. So uh, that's why, I, yeah, jot down a list of what's the, what are the subject matters that you're passionate about, that because um, that would be a technical area. Um, and then what are, what are the things on a day-to-day -day that you would not mind doing? Um, and those two together will help you make your job search a lot more targeted. I'm coming to you for career advice next time, Amy. Uh, Zahabia, 
Would you close our session with your words of wisdom today? Oh boy, got a big <laughs> juice to build. No, I will, I'll say only a quick word that, you know, you asked how COVID has been and how it is in, in jobs. And, you know, I started remotely and I haven't met colleagues in nine months and I will continue to not meet them probably for the next year. Um, so it can be a little strange, but I would say something that has been, that makes me feel really optimistic is how, how dedicated everyone still is and how everyone is still able to pursue all of the jobs and all of the things that have to get done um, on a day-to-day -day basis, even when there are bumps and, and hiccups in the road because of not being able to be in person. Um, so I feel really optimistic and I'm, and I'm extremely happy that it seems like we are going in the right direction. Thank you very much. I want to thank this panel. I have learned so much, but I also want to thank the 214 participants who have been with us on a, the most gorgeous day we've had in a long time on a Friday afternoon, because you are also the future. And I feel really positive about the honesty and the advice that everyone has shared here. What we're going to do is also, um, I'll promise this on Sid's behalf, they're gonna kill me, but that we'll look at the questions that you know we were unable to answer here and see if we can get some responses. So, but I would urge you all to join this great community um, because a community is based on the people who are there, the diversity, the interest, the goodness, the service. And thank you again for joining us. And thank you panelists for your delightful comments. Cheers. <laughs>